Good evening, and thank you for joining us tonight for the Fourth Corner Candidates Forum. Our goal is to provide you with information so you can make informed ballot decisions this November 3rd. Unfortunately, all of the Democrat candidates have declined to participate in the last week. We will still follow our tradition of asking questions that you need answers to. We want to thank Corporate Air Center for the use of this facility, which has allowed us to follow the COVID-19 guidelines, taking temperatures, wearing face masks, social spacing, etc. I also want to thank the sponsors of this event, Common Threads Northwest, The Fourth Corner, Whatcom County Association of Realtors, Associated General Contractors, Skagit Island County Building Association, Family Farmers, Whatcom Business Alliance, the Building Industry Association of Whatcom County, Caper, and the Waukee County Cattlemen. Our candidates are, and I also want to thank our candidates for participating tonight. Um, we have, uh, um, we got to find our, and our timer, Mark Nelson. Thank you, Mark. And for those that have helped do the setup and make this facility look as great as it does for those that you were online. I also want to turn the evening over at this time to Mike Kent, radio show host and realtor. And tonight is your opportunity to listen, learn, and vote in 2020. Thanks for being with us. Thank you very much and for the opportunity to be here as your moderator tonight. Uh, I also want to thank some of the broadcast affiliates. We, on YouTube, the Fourth Corner Forum is broadcasting this live, as is the good folks at KGMI, 790 AM out of Bellingham, and KAPS 102.1 FM and 660 AM, as well as TV broadcast by both Skagit 21 and Bellingham's BTV 10. Tonight's uh, opportunity a little bit different than uh, perhaps what you've seen on the national agenda the last number of weeks because this is one of the few times those who are listening at home you can cheer you can hoot and holler for your candidates anything goes in that respect because we have no audience here that can interrupt the proceedings i'm going to try and move it along as efficiently as possible our candidates will each have an opportunity to answer hopefully an equal number of questions we will strive for. We will cover as many questions as possible. As I ask a question, you will be provided one minute in order to answer the question. If you feel compelled to answer a question you were not called on, please raise the blue card in front of you, and as time permits, we will add that opportunity as well. Again, uh, this is an example of democracy in action, and on the local level, which is in the end, the most important of all. And we appreciate all those who are viewing and listening in the radio audience for participating. So with that, I'm gonna go right into the questions. The first question I have, and I'm gonna ask this of uh, Jennifer Sevzik, a District 42 House candidate. Question is, what is your position on referendum number 90, which will require all public school systems to adopt or develop comprehensive age-appropriate sexual health education? That's question number one. Well, that will be on the ballot in November, and I would encourage everyone to reject R90. Uh, we've worked very hard to get that on the ballot so that the voters can decide. And there are four things you're probably going to hear from the proponents of it, so I'd like to tell you what that's going to be. Um, the first one they're going to say is, it's harmless, read the bill. Well, notice they don't say, read the curriculum, because if you read the curriculum, then you'll see what's in it and find out that it's very graphic and not age appropriate. The second thing you might hear is that school districts can choose their own curriculum. However, it's costly, and this is an unfunded mandate, and it still has to have in the tenets that they have set forth in this curriculum that was developed with Planned Parenthood. The third thing that you'll probably hear is that it protects children from predators. However, there is no proof that this works. And the curriculum actually encourages sexual exploration and experimentation in kindergarten, which obviously robs children of their innocence. And it breaks down natural barriers for children at this age, which could make them more likely to be preyed upon. The fourth thing that you'll hear is that there's an opt-out. Well, that's not necessarily true uh, because it will be embedded throughout all the curriculum. So let's say, for example, you have three students who are opt-out in reading class and the, uh, the lesson plan is about to come up. So do you have to have a paraeducator to take those three students out? Do they have a different lesson that they get to do? Or just remember when they all go to recess, 
uh, that student gets filled in on what happened while they were gone. So please go to Inform Parents of Washington for more information and reject R90. Thank you, uh, Jennifer Sefcik, District 42 House candidate. I will ask the same question. We'll go to the opposite end of the table tonight. To the, to ask Mr. Bill Bruck. He's a District 10 House candidate. And would you like me to repeat the question? No, that's fine. So uh, great answer by Jennifer. Totally concur with all that. So uh, I think the listeners need to know this, uh, this bill uh, was passed at 2 in the morning. Uh, it was so bad that TVW had to put a disclaimer on the, web, uh, on the website, uh, on, on the actual viewing for the audience. There was 30 Republican amendments that were refused to be listened to uh, by the, the uh, chair. So the Republicans tried to stop this bill. Uh, it was 5395, SB 5395. They did everything in their power to try to stop it. Prior to that, there was hundreds, several hundred people trying to stop this bill. Uh, it, was, it was rammed through, and that's how it was passed in the first place. That led to an amazing grassroots effort during a pandemic to have 266,000 signatures, a state record, when 130,000 signatures were required to get this on the ballot. That is a phenomenal accomplishment, and it just goes you, uh, to show you um, the, actual, the actual support for that. Um, I remember trying to help with signatures on this during COVID, and it was impossible. We had, we had social distancing and things like this, but somehow it got done. So just to dovetail a little bit on what Jennifer said, to even add more to it. So yes, reject. <laughs> Reject R90 on the ballot. Thanks. Again, that is Bill Bruck, the District 10 House candidate. In keeping with talking about youth and schools and like, the next question, question number 13 in our list, um, child care is an increasing real issue for young families, even more for single parents. How would you propose to improve access and affordability for child care? And I'll start with a Carolyn Essler, and she is District 39 representative. Thank you very much, Mike, for the opportunity to be here tonight. And I am Carolyn Eslake, a uh, state representative for the 39th district. Um, I was there uh, the last three years, and my uh, committee is Early Learning and Human Services. So I have worked with child care providers for these last three years as I've been there. During the pandemic, uh, I had was in constant um, communication with our local um, caregivers and first of all their, their their first problem that they ran across was they had no kids because parents were home and they were taking care of them and so when they heard that the school districts were going to open up their schools for child care providing I went to the school districts and said why are you doing this when our child care providers who need the kids to be in their own business don't have them. And so they were very wise in getting together and making sure that they sent and referred the kids to the child care providers where they belonged. That way the school districts did not have to set up their own child care provi provisions. What we can do this next se session, and um, we are looking, it's interesting that the, the proclamations have relieved a lot of the restrictions for the child care providers. They're, they've relieved the, um, the, the background checks in, in the new employees and, uh, and, and the education, the reoccurring education that these folks have to have. Up until this point, the restrictions and the permitting process was so tough, it was difficult for new child care providers to even go into business, mm -hmm. let alone stay into business. So what we've proven through this, and certainly I'm not advocating that we don't do child background checks because we absolutely need to do that when we're dealing with our children, but what we um, need to make sure that we follow through and relieve some of the restrictions, but not that one. Thank you. I Thanks. wish to remind the candidates that the yellow is for 30 seconds. Sorry. And you chopped off right away. And Sorry. Said, and I wanted to remind you that the blue cards are for you to say, if you'd like to comment on the question that has been asked, please do so by raising the blue card and you'll be called on by the moderator. Sorry. <laughs> 
So thank you, Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative, for your response to our last question. Same question uh, to Russ Jallo, District 40, House Candidate. Would you like me to repeat the question, Russ? No, I'm good, thanks. Very good. So I know child care, my, my experience with child care and, and the, uh, I guess, the, the shortcomings of, of access is as a foster parent, um, we've taken the kids into their home and, and it was a lot easier when my wife and I were both working to say yes to providing a safe home for a child if they already had daycare. Um, if they didn't have daycare, it was pretty, it was pretty hard to find. Um, so funding is, is definitely crit critical for this uh, space and there are other areas of government that, that are wasted that we can uh, use to, to cover that cost. Um, and as far as making it affordable for those centers to be able to um, make a living, I think the, the, high, the high wages, it, um, every time we raise the minimum wage, it, it makes it harder for businesses to stay in business. And a lot of these daycare providers are small businesses. So when they are mandated that they have to raise the wages, but then the state doesn't cover, um, doesn't reimburse them for subsidized uh, kids, then that makes it hard. We saw in Bellingham that there was a, a large um, daycare uh, chain that, that just had to close. And I think the city um, went in and kind of bailed them out and had another partner with another organization to keep them running to where we had those uh, those spaces uh, for people that need them. So yeah, childcare is definitely something we need to watch. I agree with Carolyn as, as background checks is something is one area we don't need to lax up on um, because we do need to make sure those kids are safe. Uh, and then and, and just watch the, watch the red tape and the criteria that get in the way of providing care and getting services to people that need them. Thank you. Thank you, Russ Jallo, District 40 House candidate, and Luann Van Werven, District 42 representative, would like to comment. Thank you. Well, what I would like to mention is where we have come in our society to the place where uh, lifestyles are becoming more and more expensive. And the tax burden on families has gotten to the point where both mom and dad have to work. And uh, I think we should get back to the place where if a mom or a dad decided they wanted to stay home to take care of the kids, they should have that opportunity. And there is a real push and a drive to license every single child care center, even grandmas in the neighborhoods or moms who would like to be able to uh, open their homes and provide child care. Well, I think that this, this push to license every single person who would like to provide child care is wrong-headed. I will also say that um, the Department of Children and Youth Services uh, heavily regulates our child care centers, and they should be, but they are to the point now where they are so regulated that I, would, I was able to tour a, a child care center in South Bellingham, and they are told what they can sing with their children and what they can't sing the songs that they can sing to their children. Well, I think that that is, that is overreach and it's encroachment into areas that DCYF has no business doing. So I say let's make childcare, uh, let's make it more accessible for our neighborhoods, for our grandmas, for moms, and uh, let's, just make, um, uh, let's just make it easier for our families to be able to have a mom or a dad stay home with their children. Thank you. Thank you, Luann Van Werven, District 42nd representative. Uh, change the topic. Um, I'm going to shift to question number 12 from our list. The Seattle City Council recently imposed a head tax on businesses of employees earning more than $150,000 per year. What is your view of this head tax? And I will start, start with uh, Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative. Thank you, Mike, for that question. It seems that whatever happens in Seattle ends up happening in the complete state, and that really scares me with this head, head tax. They call it the jumpstart Seattle tax. Any time that we start taxing uh, wages that, uh, you know, we're, we're living in America and we're supposed to be um, working at, at free, at our free will and at our, and our, and do the very best we can. So are we going to be punished because we are doing better and making more money? That's what this is about. And so it's against all of um, uh, America's way of living, in my opinion. 
So it is a crime that they have passed this. Um, they wonder why companies like Amazon have moved out of Seattle. Uh, they still have their, their home office there, but every other community is getting warehouses and uh, Amazon buildings because they can't afford to stay in Seattle. And if we continue to do this and move it to the rest of the whole state, we will just be chasing out our, our important jobs for our people. So I am totally against this. I can't imagine where this even comes from, but um, again, we absolutely have to fight it and not allow these kinds of things to be a statewide. Thank you. Thank you, that was Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative. And the same question I would like to ask of Bill Brook, District 10 House candidate. So if we keep these uh, policies going, we're not gonna have any businesses left in our state. I, I agree with Carolyn, the, the mandates, the excess taxes, all it's doing is it's driving businesses out. When you wanna put a head tax on a business, all you're doing is you're forcing the employer to fire their people or to furlough their people or to have less employees or to raise the prices because they always pass it along to their customers. It doesn't help anybody. And we have to remember our state is competing with 49 other states. When, when we keep over-regulating and over-taxing our businesses, the businesses are gonna simply leave. There's lots of other states around the country that would be more than happy to take our businesses. Uh, it's happening way, very, very too often, very, very too frequently. So I'm adamantly opposed against a head tax, and I would hate to see it um, statewide. You know, what happens in Seattle is, I hope it stays in Seattle if the elected officials there um, are serving their constituents and the constituents want to be there and the, and the businesses are okay with it, that's fine. But I would hate to see it go statewide. Thank you, Bill Brook, District 10 House candidate. Uh, the next question, I'm going to ask question number three on our list. There are four advisory note votes on the ballot this election season. What is your solution, excuse me, there are four advisory notes votes on the ballot, all dealing with tax increases. What is your position on these? And I will start with Luann Van Werven, District 42 representative. Thank you. Well, the, just a reminder of what an advisory vote is. It is allowing for voters to, to register their opinion on taxes that were increased in the previous legislative session. So there were, there were more taxes than just that. But um, so the, the advisory vote and how we vote on that doesn't change anything, but it does allow us the opportunity to tell state government how we felt about those taxes. So I am a, I'm a huge proponent of keeping advisory votes on our ballot. So there are four of them. I voted no on three of them. I will say that I voted yes on the first one, which is a ban on plastic bags. And I did that for several reasons. We, um, we do have a problem with plastic bags. And anytime you drive down the freeway, you will see um, our freeways littered with them and also in our waterways. And so I felt it was, uh, it was an important step to make. Plus our small independent grocers really supported the ban. And uh, because the, the bags that we will use, of course, would be paper bags. And uh, this allows for them to be able to be reimbursed for these paper bags that they'll be using. The additional benefit of this bill was that it allows for our pulp mills who have been struggling mightily over the last years to be able to use the pulp uh, that they use uh, to, in order to make paper bags. So I did support the ban on plastic bags and um, think it was a very good environmental vote to take and, uh, but the other ones, I would say, repeal them. Luann Van Werven, District 42nd Representative. The same question, there are four advisory votes on the ballot, all dealing with tax increases. What is your position on these? And I'll ask this of Russ Jallo, uh, for District 40, House Kennedy. Yeah, uh, taxes are definitely something we don't need more of. Uh, we want our people to keep more of their money. So um, the last thing we need more taxes, we need government to look at, it, at itself, maybe top down, 
and, and make cuts um, as needed from the top down, not from the bottom up. I saw, kind of jumping on onto a little off topic, but we, we were at a, um, at a forum not too long ago when we learned that our adult family homes were cut to the amount that they were um, reimbursed um, from the state as a way that the, the state, basically DSHS, <clears throat> was told they need to cut their budget. And so, like other candidates have said, government or companies try to pass that along, right? So they passed along to a partner agency. So um, our government needs to cut from the top down. I remember when um, I saw uh, Representative Van Werven voted for the bag ban, and I, I asked her about it, and then I read the bill. And I saw I kind of agree with, with the points that she made on why she voted for it. And so and there's some positive things there. There were some other Republicans that tried to amend it and were shut down. But uh, mostly the, those taxes, definitely, we don't need to rebuild our economy with more taxes because there's less people working. So more taxes is going to make a higher burden on those of us that are continuing to work and families that, that do need to put food on the table. Thank you, Russ Jallo, District 40th House candidate. Uh, next question, uh, I'm going to ask question number five. COVID-19 has increased spending and budget issues. Do you support increase in spending or do you think we should find ways to reduce spending? And I'll ask the uh, first candidate to respond. Let's ask Jennifer Sevzik. She's District 42nd House candidate. Okay, thank you. Well, I think raising taxes is definitely not the answer. Uh, families and businesses have suffered enough during COVID. And during the time that Governor Inslee has been there, the budget has increased by 70%. And this does not keep up with population growth or inflation. Um, during the time that COVID was on the horizon and the House was still in session, uh, then they, there was a warning that went out that said, you know, bad things are coming down the pipes. Um, but the Democrats continued, uh, did not listen to those warnings and pushed on with the budget um, and spending that $5 billion supplemental budget. Uh, so while it looks like things are not going to be as bad as we originally thought, um, we're still going to have to have a tough session uh, coming up. And that means targeted reductions, uh, tightening the belt, and just doing some, some hard things. Um, but it can be done, and hopefully we should come out on the other side of this wiser, smarter, um, and more efficient as we look at the budget and all the different pieces of it. Thank you, Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd House candidate. I'm going to ask the same question of Luann Van Werven, District 42nd representative. Thank you for that question. Um, uh, Jennifer is right. Uh, we did have early warnings that uh, COVID was on the horizon and that we would need to make special accommodations, and, uh, but yet they barged ahead with a budget that increased by almost 20% just in this uh, budget alone. It was wrong-headed. Um, since then, we, when we have seen the extent of the budget um, crisis, we have asked Governor Inslee repeatedly for a special session so that we could get a handle on this, so we could deal with it before going into session in January. As the new programs came into, um, into play in July, we had the opportunity to roll some of those back before they went into full effect, and that would have been a very beneficial thing to do. I will say that uh, we do have a rainy day fund in Washington State, one of the best uh, decisions that was ever made. And we have, it, currently we have $2.5 billion in our rainy day budget. And uh, then recently, the last revenue projection showed an increase in sales tax revenue that came to, into Olympia and in large part because of the uh, stimulus package that came from the federal level. So we are looking at, certainly we are not where we need to be, but we can balance this budget without raising taxes. We're gonna have to dip into our rainy day fund and we are going to have to make some targeted reductions. We need to scrutinize our budget and where there is waste, we need to cut that. But it can be done and I'm going down to Olympia committed to doing just that, to be able to balance the budget without raising taxes. Thank you, Luann Van Werden, uh, District 42nd representative, and Russ Jallo, District 40 House candidate, would like to weigh in. Yeah, um, our Democrat counterparts or, or uh, opposition, they, they commonly say 
there's good news. The budget shortfall isn't as bad as we thought it was going to be. Well, the, the, the bad news is, is it shouldn't be that bad anyway. It should be a lot less than that if the governor had given the businesses um, the ability to make their own decision of whether to shut down or not. The initial shutdown was wise. After that first six weeks, um, when the president said, go ahead and open up, we should have opened up. We should have let those businesses make the decision on how they can keep their staff and their customers safe. And we would have had even a lower uh, budget shortfall. Thank you. Thank you. That's uh, Russ Jalo, District 40, House candidate. And I'd like to throw the same question over to Bill Brook, District 10, House candidate. So, uh, yeah, I just uh, agree there with Russ. The, the COVID mandates um, really, really got out of hand after the first month. And I think we all agree, everybody in this room, it was a very prudent measure. But uh, once the data started coming in, I think the mandates uh, were very, very restrictive. It was very, very tough, and it's very, very still very, very tough for businesses to operate. Um, case in point, I have a very good friend that owns a restaurant here in town locally, and he called me up a few weeks ago, and he just said, I cannot make a profit. I simply cannot make a profit under this mandate of 50% occupancy in my restaurant is maximum capacity. I need to be at 80% capacity to make a profit during my busy time. Otherwise, I have to uh, you know, get get rid of my workers and I can't pay my bills. So, um, yeah, the, I believe the COVID mandates were excessive. I'm hoping we can relax these policies. Uh, I live in the small town of La Conner. I've lived there 16 years and it's a travesty driving through town and half of the businesses are shut down right now. It's, it's very, very sad to see. And it's just a microcosm. It's happening all over the, the county, all over the district and all over the state. Um, so, yeah, I think we should definitely lift those mandates. Thank you for your comments, uh, Mr. Bill Brook, District 10 House Kennedy. Next question, question number seven, is what is your position on character assassination and defunding of local law enforcement personnel? And I will throw that question initially to Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative. It's appalling to me what they have been doing to the police. I was mayor for the city of Sultan for almost 10 years. And my job was to um, make sure that <clears throat> our streets were safe and make sure that the police department was doing what they were supposed to be doing. And we were making sure that when we did pick someone up, there was prosecution. And to the point where we realized that the prosec prosecution attorneys were not prosecuting. So we negotiated a new contract with another attorney so that in our community the criminals knew that we meant business and that's how we keep our streets safe we have got to be able to give the police the authority they need to keep our community safe i would like to say it again it's appalling to me what is happening to the police a parent just told me today that her son, who was 21 years old, was going to the police academy, and he dropped out because of this. He has been turned off that people in society are treating our police the way they are. It is appalling. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative. I'll ask the same question of Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd House candidate. What is your position <clears throat> on character assassination and defunding of local law enforcement personnel. Right. Well, I think it's very sad um, that all of these police-related events have unleashed a fury upon our uh, communities, and it's been very difficult these last few months because it's just led to more division, hatred, and racism instead of less. Um, and we need to fully support our law enforcement officers who are brave men and women who put themselves in harm's way every day. And unless we've walked in their shoes, um, I don't think we have the right to be armchair quarterbacking our law enforcement because they have very difficult jobs. And so this idea of defunding um, doesn't make any sense, um, but really they probably need more funding or more mental health officers and people to come along beside them. Um, in Whatcom County, my opponent has uh, been very unclear on her position because she's put herself out there in marching with some of the radical groups and a Whatcom Youth Advocate group 
that um, has information on their website about ACAB, which is a very devastating uh, manifesto uh, related to law enforcement and the future in law of law enforcement. Um, this sends conflicting messages to our communities, and that doesn't need to happen. Also, on, previously on the Whatcom Democrats website, they had a tab called Reimagine Police. And this was also a very radical position statement that talked about not only defunding police, but uh, abolishing police and jails. Again, this does not appear to be popular, so they've taken it down. Um, but this is an issue that divides uh, the Democrat base. And I believe that there are still um, reasonable uh, Democrats who are looking at our position and coming over to us and saying this is the more rational position to certainly support law enforcement uh, for safe communities. Because in the context, none of us can feel safe in our businesses or our homes with this foundation uh, being shaken like it is. So we need to continue to support law enforcement. And Luann and I are very happy to have the endorsement of Sheriff Bill Elfo, uh, WACOPS, which is the Washington Council of Police and Sheriffs, as well as the Linden Police Guild. Uh, because they know who's on their side. Thank you very much, Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd House candidate. Um, anyone else? In yeah, I thought maybe someone <laughs> would. Loanne Van Werven is going to weigh in, and she is, of course, District 42nd representative. Thank you. And I just wanted to speak about this issue from the uh, legislative side of things. In 2017, when I served on the Public Safety Committee, we brought together impacted families, legislators, and law enforcement community. And we came up with a bill, House Bill 3003, which expanded funding and training for our law enforcement officers in the areas of de-escalation and also with the mental health issues that a lot of them have to deal with. We also started a pilot program where in a couple of cities around the state, we would uh, embed a social worker with a police officer if they were headed to a call where there was uh, mental health implications. So what I just want uh, for everybody to know is that we have made progress here in, the, in Washington State. We are ahead of the game. We are not like some other areas, uh, inner city areas, where there is uh, law enforcement or there is uh, the situation is out of hand. We train our police officers and we do a good job of it. And uh, most of these police officers are in it for the right reasons. They are good, they are decent, and they're doing it for the right reasons. We can always improve and that's what we are about. And I am proud to have been a part of the solution here in Washington State. Thank you, Luann Van Werven, District 42nd Representative. I have to compliment everyone. We haven't heard the bell once for going over. And uh, so as a result of that, we're going to give you a greater opportunity to answer as many questions completely around the table as possible. And part of the reason we have that time allotment, in case you've just joined us for the forum, is uh, our Democratic candidates have elected not to attend, which has provided a greater opportunity for us to ask the questions further of all you. So I'm going to continue the next question, a bit of a segue, uh, question number six in our list. Our governor and attorney general have been silent on the ongoing wanton destruction of public and private property in Seattle and other cities. In your opinion, is silence addressing the problem? I'm going to start at the far end. I'll start with Bill Brook, District 10 House candidate, and work my way across. No, absolutely not. The silence is deafening and it's not helping. It's actually um, appeasement, is the way I see it. You're enabling behavior that is absolutely lawless. We have no rule of law right now going on. I mean, the Chaz and Chop thing was the most embarrassing thing. I grew up in the Bellevue area in Seattle area. I used to go down as a kid to Seattle Center and have great memories with my family and going to the waterfront. <laughs> Not anymore. I tell you, I try to speed. I try to speed up going through I-5 and get through Seattle. I don't like going to Lake Union anymore. I haven't been down there probably in eight or ten years. Um, it's very, very sad for me to see because uh, I have these very fond childhood memories of a very nice area as, as kids to go to and uh, all of that. And now that's been, been taken away. Uh, businesses are going out left and right. 
And who, who can stay in business who would want to stay in business when rioters come in and they can, they can call the peaceful protest and they can riot and destroy property and not get punished? And the governor and uh, our AG are complicit in it. And when you don't punish people, there, you enable the behavior. So I think it's absolutely the, the worst thing that can be done. And the silence is awful to me. It's embarrassing to me. We need to enforce law and order. Um, I, I really hope the voters take this seriously and we get a new governor. We need Culp in there. He would do a fabulous job. Um, his platform is amazing. Uh, we need a new attorney general as well. Matt Larkin would be a fabulous attorney general. We need a new whole state government. And uh, that's all I have to say on that issue. Thank you, Bill Brook, District 10 House candidate. Same question to Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative. Thank you. Uh, yes, silence is um, condoning what's going on, in my opinion. And uh, I, I was really disappointed in how the governor not only has continued the proclamations and the restrictions on our businesses, but also the fact that he denied that he even said he didn't know what was going on in the first weeks of, of the Seattle riots. Uh, I can't imagine anyone in a position that he is in that would not know, and then if he did, did not tell us the truth. Um, it is um, a shame that Seattle has deteriorated to the extent it has. All the big uh, family businesses that have left, the Nordstroms that we used to go to in, at Christmas time, the, um, the Macy's downtown, all of the, 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 the big stores and department stores that as our families would love to go visit Santa Claus. We will not see that again. It is gone. It is gone forever. It is a, a, just a shame that um, we have deteriorated tourism in Seattle to the point where um, flights to Seattle are down by 90 percent. It is, you know, a crime for our businesses all the way across. So uh, it's all in the leadership. I, I believe that all of that could have been stopped if the right leadership had been in place. Thank you. Thank you, District 39 Representative Carolyn Eslick. And I will toss a question over to Russ Jollo, District 40 House candidate. Yeah, I, I think it's still just complacence. That's, a, that's the only thing you can say about that. Is, uh, and he, was, he sent in the, the National Guard without weapons. So that, you know, they're going into a riot, an active um, terrorist uh, uh, operation, and they are not. <clears throat> able to defend themselves um you know good and he goes back and forth he said oh i'm not the one somebody else told me to send them in without weapons well you're the governor of the state the buck stops there um i agree with what uh, bill said is that we need a whole new government from from the governor all the way down to to our representative seat um so you know the governor needs to go the ag needs to go the only thing uh, ferguson did during that whole time of the riots was he sued big tuna because he thought he, that uh, we were being overcharged on by a two cents a can, so that's that's pretty pretty appalling that he just didn't even our law and order, um, our, our our chief law and order officer just didn't even say anything about it, and we let our city just the biggest city in our state just get destroyed. I have a friend who worked private security and he was down there protecting businesses and gave firsthand. Um, accounts of what was happening so it wasn't just a big old party it was people actively um, you know looting and causing damage and we need to protect our property and we need law enforcement to not be told to stand down we need them to be able to when need be they need to they need to fortify um, and that that kind of gets uh, you know that, that gets kind of hot water but I think we need we need to make sure to back up our people that protect our communities Thank you, District 40 House candidate Russ Jallo. I'm going to repeat the question for those who may have just joined in in the listening audience. The question we're working on now is, our governor and attorney general have been silent on the ongoing wanton destruction of public and private property in Seattle and other cities. In your opinion, is silence addressing the problem? And up next is Luann Van Werven to take on that question, and she's our District 42nd representative. Well, the, the words we all remember from Jay Inslee, the infamous words, was 
news to me when he was asked about the chop and the chaz that was happening in downtown Seattle. And I think we were all shocked by what we saw play out on our TVs at uh, the evening news. It was appalling. And, um, and my opponent has been silent on this issue as well. But you know, there's a reason why they're afraid to speak out because the radical leftists in the De Democrat Party are, uh, are taking over the Democrat Party. And so they are, they are afraid to speak out because they're going to make their base very unhappy about this. So um, I think they're in a situation where they don't dare speak out, but they should. And I would just call on my opponent to speak out and in opposition to uh, what we see, this violence in the streets of Seattle, Portland, and even coming into downtown Bellingham as well. Like it was said earlier, what starts in Seattle usually bleeds out into the rural areas and also our smaller urban centers as well. Thank you, District 42nd Representative Luann Van Werven. And the last <clears throat> along the table here, same question, <clears throat> Jennifer Sebzik, District 42nd House Candidate. Thank you. Now this is probably one of the most unbelievable situations I think most of us have witnessed in our lifetime. Uh, we have these twin cities, Portland and Seattle, that are like rebellious children and there's no adult uh, to make them behave. And this is just a blatant disregard for people's welfare, uh, mm -hmm. respect for property. I mean, who would want to build a business or a home in Seattle with this sort of lawlessness? And so it seems like uh, the leader of Seattle just want tourism and big tech. Um, but you know, big tech is moving out to Bellevue. They're going to leave uh, Seattle as well. They can leave our state pretty easily now that we know how everybody can work at home. Um, and tourism is definitely down. Um, when we had friends that used to come in and see us, we would look forward to them uh, going with us to Seattle. Um, but that's not even on the table anymore. Um, nobody wants to go to Seattle. And this is just bad PR for our state. Um, it's going to continue to drive business away and just continue to um, depress the morale of the citizens of Washington State unless this gets reined in. Hopefully we'll have new leadership on November the 4th and we can look forward to things improving. Thank you, Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd House candidate. I want to take an opportunity. Uh, earlier we were joined here at the forum and he is safely distanced at the back of the room and want to welcome Mr. Jim Nelson with the Whatcom Superior Court. And thank you for attending. Appreciate you being here. Thank you. And next question, uh, number nine we're going to ask is, will you act to amend laws that unreasonably restrict citizens' civil liberties such as property rights? And we will start in the center. Let's talk, start with Russ Jallo, District 40, House candidate. So yeah, I support property rights and we definitely need to make sure that uh, people have the right to do um, with, their, with their property when they, when they buy it. So water is the, is the biggest, the hot topic around here, uh, particularly in Skagit Valley, our water right, the water rights were given away um, via adjudication and, and the same thing happens uh, that wants to happen. Our, our, the Democrats want to give away the water rights in, in Whatcom and other areas so that when you build a, you buy a house so you have no right um, to do you know what you want with that home until unless you go through a third party we had we are our tribal um, neighbors so we, we need to protect property rights water rights and others um, from uh, un, undue legislation thank you thank you uh, Russ Jallo district 40 house candidate and I'll put the same question to Carolyn Eslick district 39 representative when I first arrived in Olympia, the capital budget was being withheld because of the Hearst decision. So we had to go into session and um, negotiate to be able to um, release the capital budget. And every county um, was relieved except for Skagit. And because of that, there is now um, a water committee that our Senator Wagner has been sitting on since then. It is a struggle every day to keep those water rights for our property owners. What is the crime is the folks that have had their property for 80 years and they were not allowed to build another house or to dig another well. And why is that? 
And it all has to do with negotiations with the salmon, um, the, the rainwater, how you're supposed to save the rainwater. What, what is logical sometimes does not seem to be the fit anymore. And again, it is thankful. I am very thankful that the Senator Wagner is on that committee so that we know that we've got some folks that are there for our people. Property rights, personal rights, Second Amendment rights, that's what I stand for, and that's what I'll fight for again when we go to Olympia. Thank you. You've just heard from Carolyn Essig, District 39 representative. The same question to Bill Brook, District 10 House candidate. As legislators, you take an oath of office when you're sworn in to uphold the Constitution. And the Constitution, both our federal Constitution and state Constitution, is all about property rights and uh, personal, personal sovereignty. Um, I take it uh, very seriously when the property rights are taken away and the water rights, especially here in Skagit County. For Skagit County to be exempt and all the other counties aren't, uh, what does that say about our, our county? Uh, property rights are vital to everybody and property also includes business. When you have a business and you have a family business and you've put your life and soul into your business and it's being taken away because of mandates, that's government taking your property. As far as I see it, it's seizing your property. If you're forced to lose a business after you've been in business 30, 40, 50 years, generations, and you're permanently closed because you can't operate anymore, how is that not taking your property? How is that not a violation of our personal freedoms and our constitution? So uh, yeah, I'm a big defender of property rights and water rights. Thank you, Bill. District 10, House candidate. Same question, please, for uh, Luann Van Werven, District 42nd representative. Well, our property rights and our civil liberties is the foundation of our state constitution and our national constitution. And, uh, you know, when I think about how our civil liberties have been inhibited during this COVID crisis, um, I, I am sad to think about how uh, state government has been able to come in and to, to limit our lifestyle, to limit our civil liberties. And I fear that there will be a civil liberties loss that we will not be able to get back. You know, um, I think there's a fundamental difference in how we view, you know, how we, our worldview when it comes to dealing with this COVID crisis. I trust our businesses and I trust individuals to do what is right. If we give them the information, things that, you know, common sense things like wash your hands, social distance, wear a mask, those kind of things, then our businesses and our individuals would have the, have the information to make the best decisions for their businesses and uh, for their employees and also for the people that they serve in their businesses. But the other um, worldview is that only government can make those right decisions. And so what has happened then as a result, our civil liberties have been thwarted and inhibited and it is time to open back uh, our society, open up our economy. We can do it safely. We just uh, need to trust the people to do the right thing. And, uh, and I, I trust our, our businesses and our people to do the right thing when it comes to opening up and doing it safely. Thank you, Luann Van Werven, District 42nd Representative. Mm -hmm. And the same question to Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd House candidate. Sure. Um, unless you lived in 1918, you probably haven't experienced a pandemic before, uh, so most of us haven't. So this was new, uncharted territory for us. So in the beginning, when we were told that we needed to all quarantine and keep ourselves and our germs at home, we were willing to do that for a couple of weeks. Um, we did that in anticipation of flattening the curve. Um, but then we just had this indefinite continuation of the lockdown, even after it was determined it wasn't as deadly as we originally thought it was. So it has been unprecedented, the loss of freedoms that we've experienced. Who would have thought that you couldn't go to a hospital and be with your loved one um, who was suffering? Who would have thought that you couldn't have a funeral, a memorial service, that you couldn't have a wedding, um, that we can't open our businesses? I mean, this is an 
incredible loss of freedom for us. And as Luann said, it, it's really frightening to think that some of those might not come back. Um, the state of Pennsylvania uh, had a governor that's similar to ours, and several people brought suit against him. And a couple of weeks ago, there was a federal ruling on uh, the lockdown, and I'd like to share what he said with you. Um, it said, even in an emergency, the authority of government is not unfettered. The liberties protected in the Constitution are not fair-weather freedoms, in place when times are good, but able to be cast aside in times of trouble. The solution in a national crisis can never be permitted to supersede the commitment to individual liberty that stands as the foundation of the American experiment. And I would wholeheartedly agree with that. Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd House candidate. So uh, as news changes on a daily basis, sometimes our questions are also fluid as well. We have a question we would not have asked yesterday or even this morning that I'm going to ask now. And the state Supreme Court ruled the $30 car tab initiative that was passed by 53% of the voters last year is invalid today because the title was confusing. What now? And I'll start with Jennifer Sevzik. Right. Well, whether or not you agreed with the $30 car tabs, it's unconscionable that the will of the people has been ignored and that it even had to go to a lawsuit. Um, when they write out the initiatives, those, the language on that is approved by the Attorney General. So there should have not been the question of multiple questions in it um, and that the will of the people didn't know what they were voting on. So this is just an egregious uh, situation where the will of the people has been ignored. Same question to Luann Van Werven, our District 42nd representative. I was hoping this question would come up. It's very relevant. And today when we heard this ruling out of the, out of the state Supreme Court, I was extremely disappointed, although not very surprised. The state Supreme Court here in Washington State rarely uh, abides by the will of the people when it comes to our initiatives. I will say that um, as a member of the Transportation Committee, we had made adjustments to our transportation budget to, to uh, allow for the enactment of $30 car taps. And uh, we reprioritized our spending and we were prepared into budgets into the future in order to uh, accommodate the will of the people when it comes to $30 car taps. My opponent, as a Blaine City Council member, actually supported a uh, resolution in Blaine City uh, Council that uh, basically told the, the voters of Blaine to vote against or vote for or vote against $30 car taps. So they were supporting a yes vote. Well, um, the state of Washington, the Whatcom County, and also even the city of Blaine did not agree with my opponent. She was on the wrong side of that issue, and, uh, and it is unfortunate that the will of the people was not honored when it comes to $30 car taps. And so now it's gonna be up to the legislature uh, to go back and to enact $30 car tabs. And we can do this without cutting our budgets. And uh, we can make accommodations. We proved that we were able to do that when it comes to our transportation budget in this previous year. Thank you, Luann Van Werven, 42nd mm -hmm. District Representative. And same question for Russ. Jalo, District 40, House candidate. Yeah, that's just appalling that uh, something can pass, uh, or the, the will of the people can can be it can be just ignored in an election like that. Um, we saw that with the 30 dollars car tabs. I think all but three counties in the state um, said we want 30 dollars car tabs, and of course Seattle being the largest county, um, now they trump everybody else, depending on on, on what you look at. So that's. Um, just appalling that you could, and what, what's next? Are they gonna challenge some other vote that they don't like, that all of a sudden King County is gonna look at and say, we don't like that vote because of, because of the, the, it just isn't popular? And our state Supreme Court, they're supposed to be, you know, our defense holding up our constitution and looking and, and standing up for our rights when they were gonna let mass murderers out of prison at the beginning of COVID. 
because of because of they they were affected that those people were going to get, get COVID. Well, if masks works, couldn't you just put a mask on them? But so our our state supreme court needs an overhaul, and we at least we have one conservative candidate, Dave Larson, who's running, um, and and that would be you know one good vote um, among among the others that just think that uh, go along with whatever uh, Inslee and, and Ferguson say. But uh, the will of the people is the will of the people, and whether we like it or not, that's that's what. The, the vote is what stands. Thank you, District 40 House Representative, or excuse me, House Candidate, uh, Mr. Russ Jolla for weighing in. Same question to Carolyn Eslick. She's a District 39 representative. Same question. Thank you very much. You know, I don't know how many times the citizens have to pass a bill, uh, pass a, a law to make it stick. Several years ago, the same license was uh, passed and the legislature added more taxes to it. So it ended up to be hundreds of dollars in some cases. And now they tried it again. I mean, how many times do the citizens have to do this? It just makes me crazy sometimes to, to really stop and think about how the legislature does not listen to the citizens. That's the first thing that I learned in this business. You've got to Keep your ears to the grindstone. You have to be in the community. You have to know what the people are talking about. So the funny thing that I found today when the news media announced it was they considered it a win-win. A win because it follows the Constitution. And it's a win because your transportation projects will continue because the money will be there. Well, as Luann, Representative Van Werven just mentioned, I too sit on the transportation committee with her, and we had already made provisions if it was, can, if it was upheld at $30. It is wrong, and we have got to, as a legislature, listen to our citizens. So that's where I stand with that, and I will continue to listen to them. Thank you, Carolyn Essick, District 39 representative. Same question for you, Bill Brook. Well, I agree with all my colleagues and all the comments. Uh, it's appalling to me, but it doesn't surprise me at all. Um, the Democrat and liberal agenda, they have a habit when they don't get their way to change the rules or change the uh, guidelines or whatever it takes, uh, count enough ballots, whatever it takes until they get their victory. And this is appalling. It's very, very upsetting. Personally, it should not be your agenda. If it's the will of the people and it's 50 plus one, that is the will of the people. I disagree with, actually, well, I agree with Carolyn, but she brought up a point. The media is saying it's a win-win, calling it a win for the Constitution. It's not a win for the Constitution. This is against the state constitution because the state constitution allows the people to put forward referendums and initiatives. And when it, there's a tremendous amount of work and time, and when you go through all of that and you get the will of the people and it passes, and then the liberal courts say, no, we don't like it, we're going to say no. We're going to throw it out on a technicality because of a ballot title. How is that following the Constitution? So um, I have a big problem with it. Um, and it's, again, it's not my, I, for the record, I voted against $30 car cabs. Not my agenda. It's not Bill Brooks' agenda. It's a, it's a will the people's agenda. I had my own personal reasons. I voted no. But uh, if you don't get your way, you don't get to change the rules and say we're going to change it until the way we want it. And it seems like that's happening far too often in our state. Uh, it's another reason why we need more balance and more Republican votes down there. Uh, we Right now, the executive branch, we're, we don't even have a legislative branch because we're under edict um, and under the state mandates still. Uh, we have, we've lost the court system, and we just need more Republicans down there. We need more Republicans vote in the Senate, in the House, at the executive level, and judicial level as well. Thank you, Bill Brook, District 10 House candidate. We're going to take a slight break right now. What we're going to do is give an opportunity to Mr. Jim Nelson, who was kind and gracious enough to attend the forum tonight. While he may not be on our panel, we do want to afford him the opportunity to speak. We're going to give you two minutes to speak, Jim. So uh, thank you for, for, I didn't expect to be able to speak tonight. I, uh, the, some judges made the, uh, candidates made the decision that they didn't want to come. I, I wanted to come to be a, a spectator. So it was a pleasure to be here. I really uh, enjoyed listening to, to all of you speak. And um, 
So I, I, I'll say a few things. Uh, one is um, I'm, a, I'm a veteran. Uh, I um, enlisted in the Marine Corps when I got out of high school. I, um, I worked as a respiratory therapist, actually, uh, and uh, paid my way through law school. My first job was in Snohomish County Deputy Prosecutor's Office. And um, I worked there for a while, and then I, I came uh, to, to Skagit as a special deputy on a, on a case. And uh, I liked uh, uh, living north of, uh, I liked living north of where I, I had been living. I, I had been living in, in Everett, and I really liked the area. And, um, but I liked uh, Whatcom County better, and I moved to Bellingham. And so uh, during that time, I was uh, a, a city prosecutor, and, I was, and then I did uh, private practice as well. And I've uh, been an attorney for over, 31 years now, and um, uh, I've done a lot of things. I've been in a lot of courts in a lot of counties. Uh, I've, I, I enjoy going to other counties and other places and seeing how everybody does things. And I've I practiced in um, over five counties, Whatcom County, of course, and Skagit County, of course, being uh, two of those. And um, I've had the opportunity to, to, to go into our appellate courts, uh, have cases in the uh, Court of Appeals, as well as the State Supreme Court and the U.S. Supreme Court. So I've, I, I've, got a, uh, I've, I've been around and I've really enjoyed the things I've done. I've done all kinds of other things other than criminal, you know, as well as divorces and um, uh, civil cases, probate cases, and things of that nature. And um, one of the things that a point I'd like to make is that you, uh, the judges' elections are different. The judicial elections are different, and I think we need to, to look at them differently uh, because we have a situation now where, where there's a lot of appointments going on. And um, there's a lot of people that take the office on an appointment and, and keep it uh, after election because they receive these things called endorsements. Now, I think endorsements are fine for non-judicial uh, uh, candidates. But when I first started practicing, I remember, and I think it was on a property rights case, where um, in another county, not Skagit County or Whatcom County, where um, the person's property was being uh, uh, condemned, uh, they wanted to condemn it, and they said, and, and he said, how how can I get a fair trial when the the, the judge received endorsements from from the uh, prosecuting attorney who's prosecuting this case and from the other elected officials in this county um, that uh, are behind the prosecution of this case. And I, I thought, you know, it's a good question. It's a good question. I can understand where folks like yourselves need endorsements and need ca campaign contributions, but um, it's something that's always bothered me and came up again and again and again in many situations. And so I decided to, to run uh, my campaign uh, without uh, asking uh, endorsements from elected officials or uh, accepting campaign contributions. And that's a little bit different, it's hard, uh, but I think it's something that, uh, that we all should think about um, in the future. You really want to have uh, this bright, clear line between the judge and the parties and their attorneys, and we never want to cross that line, and we want to protect that line because we want our judge to be judges to be independent all the time, on all of our cases. We don't want to have the the, the uh, experience that the person that I just told told you about had of, of worrying about those types of things. Uh, so <clears throat> we um, we all would benefit from that, I believe. And uh, so that's why I decided to do it in this, I'm doing it in this particular race. Because judges have a lot of power. You know, they have power to disperse your property, have, have power to take your children away, have power to, to put you uh, in jail, have power to do uh, many, many other things. And we want the judges not to have any other type of outside influence or to be perceived as having any type of outside influence. We, they need to be perceived as being completely fair, impartial, and independent. Uh, people say there's no justice in the courtroom. I think that, uh, I, I know that that is one of the things that, uh, that people who have had uh, superior court experience as, as, uh, uh, as um, parties have, have felt that. A lot of us 
most of you probably have never been in superior court for for any reason and, and you're lucky but uh, when you when you ha have that experience of being in court you want to be uh, uh, you want to judge this totally independent and fair and impartial and you may the endorsers may be your best friends uh, the the uh, the sheriff and the police agencies, and, and, I've, and I can add to what was said tonight, I've worked with many, many police officers and uh, sheriff's deputies throughout 31 years, and I have never, and I mean never, met a police officer that um, ever crossed the line uh, in any way, shape, or form. And so I'm, I'm so totally uh, proud of the police in this in this area, but I know it goes on in other parts of the country. We've seen the videos, and we don't like it. And I probably should wrap this up. <laughs> Is that what you? I, I see you walking talking to me. So those those are a few things that I that I just wanted to say. And again, thank you very much for for letting me speak. And it has been a pleasure being here. Thank you, Mr. Nelson. In case you've just joined us, uh, you're listening to the Fourth Corner Candidates Forum. Um, we have about 30 minutes left, and we'll get through a couple more questions, and we're going to give each candidate an ample opportunity to have a uh, closing statement, probably as long as you would like, perhaps even more than you would like. So, But first of all, back to the questions. Next question is, the cost of housing, which is near and dear to my heart, in much of Northwest Washington has escalated to levels unaffordable to many of our residents. What is your solution to owners and renters to address this crisis? And I think I'm going to start this time with, we'll start with Luann Van Werven, District 42nd Representative. Well, I think the first issue we need to deal with is the reform of the Growth Management Act. Uh, there is a, a lack of focus on affordable housing, which is supposed to be one of the tenets of the Growth Management Act. There are 13 different sections to the Growth Management Act, and uh, we do not pay enough attention to affordable housing. Now, the what happens with, uh, with GMA is that it restricts the land that is available for, for building. So what happens then is the property is more expensive. So I think that there are many ways that we can mitigate this. I think we should uh, provide incentives for uh, developers to build uh, different home, homes uh, and residences of, for all income levels. And uh, we need to be able to provide incentives for, uh, for uh, lumber, for the building supplies. All of those become much more expensive uh, because of the Growth Management Act. I will add that uh, we have a housing trust fund in the state of Washington in the legislature. $800 million has been spent in the housing trust fund over the last 10 years. But most of that has gone into Seattle and into our urban areas. And we have not seen housing become more available or more affordable as a result of that. So um, I would say we need a reform of the GMA, and that is the first step that we can take in order to provide more affordable housing. Thank you very much, Luann Van Werven, District 42nd Representative. Same question to you, Russ Jallo, in addressing the escalation, very fast escalation of housing pricing and how difficult it is for our buyers. And so reforming the Growth Management Act is, is, is a good start as well as maybe cutting through some of the red tape that uh, kind of constrain builders and slow down projects and add extra costs to that project to make it harder to get something built so that we have uh, more housing available for people to, for people to rent or purchase. Um, the other part of it is property taxes. They add more property taxes on top of taxes on top of taxes that just raise the cost of our properties. Um, and for you, for you renters that are listening, you still pay property tax. The, the, the cost of rent goes up when the property tax goes up. Um, and so so when, when you see a, a levy or, or a bond or whatever and you, and you think, oh, I'm not gonna pay that, well, you will because the landlord isn't just some, you know, uh, you know fat cat sitting in the penthouse that's, that's rolling around in dough. You know, he, you know, that landlord may be a small business owner, right? So, and his small business is 
uh, rental property that he's that he's putting on the market for, for to provide housing, and he's not making a ton of money. He's he's got slim margins, just like a restaurant or any other business. So we need we need more housing, and we need to make sure that it's not just housing for low-income folks that subsidize, but we need more housing for people who are in a position to buy or people who are in a position to rent something a little bigger. So we, we definitely, housing is, is something that, when we talked about water rights too, that all comes into play when you talk about housing. There, so there's, it's, it's a multifaceted thing that, and we need to do what we can, get government out of the way some, on, on a lot of fronts so we can get housing for people who need it. Thank you, District 40 House candidate, Mr. Russ Jallo. I'll ask the same question of Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative. Thank you. I was on city council in the 90s when the Growth Management Act came to be. And we in our little city of Sultan were allocated population by 2035, 11,000 people. We very soon realized that allocation was way out of sight for us, but we couldn't do anything about it we had to uh, plan for that many people, and that meant that our sewer treatment plant had to have an upgrade to the tune of the plan alone was $1 million. Our citizens had to pay that in order to abide by the Growth Management Act, and if we did not, we would be sanctioned by the state of Washington, which means they would hold our taxes. That was my first job when I became mayor in 2008, was to go before the Growth Management Act and ask for a lenience until we could get our, our plan in order and ask for a lower uh, population, which we managed to do in, in just a few months. So we did, but in the end, our citizens paid for a, a plan that was a million dollars. They had to pay that. That is a crime, and we do need to overhaul the Growth Management Act. It is about time that we did that. Thank you, um, Luann, for bringing that out, because that is where we need. We are looked at in the state of Washington ranking 46 out of 50 states for cost of living and housing. That is a crime. Thank you. Thank you, Carolyn Eslick, our District 39 representative. Same question for Bill Brook. District 10 House candidate. So it's a simple supply and demand issue. In the state of Washington, we have 235,000 units short. I mean, think about that. 235,000 units short. And we wonder why costs of, of properties are so high. I'm a property manager, and I've seen costs escalate the last four or five years skyrocket. And the tenants, I mean, with all due respect to Mount Vernon, I'll give you a quick example. Mount Vernon is a nice place, but we have about a 20, 25 year old duplex. It's about 1,200 square feet. That property now rents over $1,550 a month. That's to give you an average. That's very, very difficult to make, and that's just rent. Now you throw in a water bill, you throw in electricity, garbage, sewer, and then upkeep. And how, how can you afford to, to do any, anything? And so that's why you have too many renters now. It's very difficult to buy a house. And the, it's a supply demand. So we need more supply. Now, all of the comments I completely agree with. GMA, we got to relax some of, the, some of these measures. If you own property and it takes one or two or three years to build it and develop it and sell it, all of those costs are compounding and they're growing and all of those costs get passed on what Russ was saying to the tenant or to the purchaser and that's why prices of housing are so high so we have to relax yes I agree GMA for sure uh, give them way, maybe more local control there was a bill last year in flow uh, or infill development I would like to see some of that happen uh, there's lots of rural areas where you could do uh, some zoning you have to relax the zoning standards first but if you relax the zoning and you can allow some infill growth give like Lu Luann was saying give some tax breaks uh, tax incentives maybe some sales tax breaks uh, credits for developers and we can get the cost down and then that would also incentivize low-income housing as well Thank you, District 10 House candidate, uh, Mr. Bill Brook. And same question to you, Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd. All right. 
Thank Ken. you. Um, as Bill said, it is just a basic um, supply and demand issue. Economics 101 tells us the supply and demand uh, drives cost. And right now, the supply, probably in most of our districts, is definitely being driven down because of the lawlessness of Seattle. Uh, people are fleeing Seattle out into the smaller cities and the surrounding areas, which is just continuing to drive up our cost. Um, but the basic components of housing cost are, uh, first of all, land. Uh, you have labor, raw materials, and then you have the government process, which is permitting taxes, inspections, and then you have profit. But the two areas that can most likely be affected by, by the legislature are the land uh, first, and again, as we've talked about in the Growth Management Act, um, there is a shortage of buildable land, which will just continue to keep costs high. Um, in Whatcom County, we also have a zoning, lack of zoning, and we also have a lack of infrastructure in some areas. So if those areas could be addressed, we could uh, possibly get some more land uh, for, for building. Uh, and then the area of the government, you know, again, you have taxes, permits, um, inspections, which when there are delays, they take a long time. Um, those costs are all just passed on to the builder, which ultimately gets passed on in the cost of the housing, again, driving up those costs. So we have a lot of issues to deal with, but first thing we've got to do is really get some land uh, to build on. Thank you very much. That's uh, Jennifer Sevzik, District 42nd House candidate. Um, I think what I'm going to do, I have more questions I'd like to ask, but in the interest of allowing you each enough time to give a generous closing statement, I'm going to turn it over to you folks at this point, and I will give each of you two and a half minutes for a closing statement, if you think that's the appropriate amount of time. And I will start uh, at the far end, and we will let Bill Bruck. He is a House candidate for District 10. The floor is yours, Bill. Thank you. So, uh, and again, thanks for everybody for showing up today. It's just very important, and it's very, very important for the voters out there to get to know their representatives and future representatives. So, again, thank you for doing this forum. Thank you to Fourth Corner and Common Threads. Uh, this, this is a very, very important election. Uh, we need everybody to get out and vote. I'm running for office because the excess taxation and overregulations and mandates coming out of Olympia is just too much. Uh, there's way, way too much disparity as well. In the State House, I'm running for Legislative Di District 10 State House. It is 57 to 41, Democrat to Republican. How can you get anything done? Uh, basically, it is a mandate. Whatever the Democrat caucus wants to do, it gets done. I'm running to try to get some balance down there and to try to get some common sense business down there. I have 30 years of practical business experience. I have real estate experience, estate planning experience, and for the last 10 years, I've been a property manager. Uh, I own my own property biz management business. I manage properties all throughout Skagit County. I manage properties in Alger, Anacortes, Fidalgo Island, Burlington, Mount Vernon, La Conner, uh, and Cedar Woolley. I manage properties that are a mix of commercial, industrial, residential, rural reserve, and agriculture. Uh, I have lots of tenants and um, lots of diverse tenants. I enjoy my business, but it's been very, very difficult for me going through this COVID time watching my friends lose their businesses. Uh, my opponent has been heavily advocating for more taxes. He's voted for 11 taxes over the last two years. He's also a big proponent of the sex ed bill 5395, which we talked about earlier in the forum, uh, mandating uh, K through 12, starting in kindergarten, sex ed, very graphic sex, sex ed curriculum throughout K through 12. As Jennifer talked about, it's, uh, if you look at the curriculum, please read the, look at the curriculum. Ninth grade, they're talking about calling them the pregnancy years. Now think about it. Now whose agenda is that? It's Planned Parenthood. Why would you ask little children, what gender do you want to be in your next lifetime? What kind of question is that to ask a kindergartner? This is just too much. So I'm going to down there to try to change uh, what's happening. Please vote for Bill Brook. Thank Legislative you. Legislative District 10 State. And Carolyn Eslick, District 39 representative, your opportunity for closing statements. Thank you very much again. Thank you all for being here. And thank you for this wonderful um, display. We had some great refreshments and the place looks wonderful tonight. It just really sets the tone. I appreciate all you folks have done to welcome us here. 
Um, I, I am Carolyn Eslick and I am the state representative for the 39th district and I am looking forward to my fourth session this coming up year. The time I've spent in Olympia has opened my eyes to many things. They, the first thing that I was introduced to was my, was my three committees and they are transportation, capital budget, and early learning and human services. I didn't know how much I was going to appreciate those committees till I got down there and understood what it was all about. Transportation was fabulous because I've lived on Highway 2 for 30 some years and realized that we needed a voice down there. Highway 9, um, up here on uh, Highway 20, all of the roundabouts that are being put in today, uh, they, they, the, uh, the, the projects that have got to be continued, I am thankful to be on the Transportation Committee to be able to voice those. The Early Learning and Human Services has been incredible because mental, I'm on the Children's Mental Health Committee and it is about giving parents back their right and their voice for their children. I helped pass that law two years ago so that age 13 to 17, parents have the right and can introduce their children to the mental health and medical health and be involved in their life. They are not told they can't be anymore. So that was huge for us. Broadband is huge this coming year. We all know more and more people are using Wi-Fi at home and how many times you've been on a Zoom meeting and been kicked off yourself because there might be three other people in your household that are doing the same thing. We've got to get rural band, broadband out. I am proponent and we are working on a pilot, pilot project right now for that. Um, I am anxious to get back to work in um, the legislature. It seems that we're going to be Zoom meeting. That is crazy to me, but um, if that's the only way we can meet, then that so be it. But I really believe we need to go back into session before January and settle the budget. Thank you. I'm Carolyn Eslick, 39th District State Representative. Thank you. Next candidate, uh, Russ Jallo, District 40 House candidate. Closing statement, please. Yeah, thank you. So I'm Russ Jallo running for uh, for uh, house, the state house of the 40th district, representing uh, parts of Whatcom, Skagit, and all of San Juan County. Um, I jumped into this right kind of in the thick of the pandemic, so campaigning was going to be a little different, um, mainly because it's harder to kind of get out and meet with people. Um, the other part was I work full time. I'm, you know, work in self employment, and I get out and I, if I'm not working, then I don't have money to support my family. So, um, so I'm a little different than. Other, other candidates may, may be uh, full-time campaigning, but I'm kind of working full-time and, work, and campaigning full-time and, and working to, to earn your vote so I can represent, as Bill said, a balanced approach in Olympia. We're off balance. Uh, the 40th District has been Democrat for a long time, and in recent years we replaced um, kind of do-nothing establishment Democrats with far-left extreme progressives. Uh, my opponent was appointed um, so he didn't even earn the spot on his own merit. He was he was given the spot and and he's seeking re-election. Um, but we we definitely we don't need an extreme radical environmental lobbyist. Uh, he actively works for a special interest group. My special interest is the people of Washington State and the people of the 40th district and helping make Washington a great place to live that we all enjoy. Um, I've worked. In, in Southern California, I escaped high cost of living down there, and I don't want to do it again. I've worked with people from all different countries around the world that came to America because, you know, it is the place where you can be anything you want. You come with nothing, and you can build a business. Washington is squashing small business. We're driving large businesses out of the state. My opponent wants to focus on small businesses, but he fails to realize that those big businesses and enable the small businesses to thrive because the big businesses employ more people than a small mom and pop shop. So we need to support our businesses of all sizes. Get Washington working. My children have really suffered as far as being at home and not seeing their friends and not playing sports. Uh, Zoom meetings don't cut it for school. We have homeschool curriculum that we use that. We still get on Zoom so they can see their friends and hopefully stay connected with teachers if they go back into the classroom. So we need, we need to change things in Washington State so Washington can thrive. Thank you. Thank you, Luann Van Werven, District 42nd Representative. We have 
two minutes apiece to get everyone in. Thank you. Thank you. Well, it has been my honor to serve the 42nd District for the past six years, and I'm looking forward to going back to Olympia. I want to thank the organizers tonight for running this COVID-compliant in-person candidate forum. It is really good to be here and uh, to interact with each other. And it is unfortunate that the Democrats chose not to attend. There's a lot of important issues that we are talking about tonight, and you would have seen great contrast between myself and my opponent. And, um, and just a couple of the things that uh, didn't come up tonight, but there's adjudication coming uh, in, the, in the 42nd District in the Nooksack River Basin. That is a, a lawsuit uh, by the state of Washington with uh, the Department of Ecology that would determine the water rights here in the 42nd District. My opponent supports adjudication. I oppose adjudication because it will be devastating for our agriculture, for our farmers. Uh, my opponent also supports a B&O tax, a business and occupation tax on grocery stores because she believes that they did so well during this uh, COVID crisis that they should have to pay more. That shows me that she doesn't know much about the grocery business because they run on very thin margins. The other issue is that, of course, a $30 car tab, she was on the wrong side of that. I'm looking forward to going back to Olympia because there's still much to be done. In my uh, work on the Innovation, Technology, and e Economic Development Committee, we call it ITED for short, uh, we are looking to fill the gaps of broadband and internet service for the state of Washington for rural and underserved areas because so many people are now finding when they are, the students are at home and people working from home. Thank you. We need to fill those gaps. So thank you for your thank vote. You. I look forward to going back to Olympia. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Jennifer Sevcik, District 42nd House candidate. Thanks for your patience as well. Oh, sure. Uh, well, my name is Jennifer Sevcik, and I am excited to be running. We moved to Whatcom County almost 12 years ago because we wanted a place to put down roots and raise our family. And now those three children that we started uh, began raising here are now college and career age. And so that will allow me to be your full-time representative. Unlike my opponent who has young children and also has a full-time six-figure salary for working part-time at Western Washington. I will be a representative who will support Cherry Point Industries and the jobs. Our agricultural community, and like Luann said, I do not support adjudication uh, as it would hurt our farmers. And I'll also support businesses and families. Right now you can tell it's Halloween time because the Democrats are trying to trick us into thinking they're actually supportive of businesses and more conservative than they really are. When we know that their policies tend to be those that only increase taxes and do not help businesses to thrive. My degree and my background is in 20 years of sales and marketing. Um, and although I've spent the last 15 years raising my children, um, that has been spent coaching speech and debate, which has allowed me to actually spend a year uh, immersed in government policy, which little did I know would come in handy for such a time as this. There are a host of issues that concern our state right now moving forward, and I don't think the I think that the differences between the Republicans and the Democrats could not be more clear right now, as in um, what has happened during this period of this pandemic. But I want Washington State to be a place where people want to move to and not flee from as they want to go to Montana and Idaho right now. Uh, we've had enough of that. Uh, we want to create a friendly place where people want to come and live and bring their businesses and can have great jobs. Let's make Washington red again. Thank you. Well, I want to take an opportunity to thank all of our candidates for being here tonight, and especially the folks listening. Without our voters, there's no reason for us to be in this beautiful facility tonight. And as Luann pointed out, practicing uh, uh, everything as safely as possible with the goal to get the information out to voters as efficiently as we can. Uh, I want to thank the Fourth Corner Candidates Forum for putting this together, and I encourage all who are watching or listening to tonight's program, do get out and vote. Encourage those around you, your neighbors, your friends, to do the same. 
Many, many have given much for that opportunity and the right to do that. Please exercise that right. Thank you so very much and appreciate all of the stations, television, internet, etc., for getting this out to as many possible voters as possible. Again, thank you very much and travel home safely tonight.